can you do a James Hetfield? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! That is very good. <laughs> A cappella metal, or my favorite uh, rakatakataka powered metal, uh, Fan Canto are definitely a unique band. Formed in 2006, they immediately caught the attention of metal fans by replacing the use of guitars and bass with their own voices and using this approach uh, with many heavy metal classics. Their covers of Wishmaster by Nightwish and Battery by Metallica have each received millions of views on YouTube, as has also been the case with some of their original songs such as Speed of Light and Last Night of the Kings. Their new album, To the Power of Eight, will be released on June 4th via Naval Records. Stefan Schmidt is one of the founding members of Fan Canto, officially in charge of the lower rakataka vocals, and he joins me today. Stefan, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Hello, and yeah, thanks for having me, and you, you just put it exactly right with that lower rakataka vocals, and I hear that you are perhaps a guitar singer as well. Because I, I saw that you have these uh, tutorials on YouTube, so perhaps I'll, I'll follow one and, and try to make it uh, my career at some point. Yeah, uh, it would but, be good to have some companion. After 15 years, we're still waiting for the second Metal A Cappella band to show up, so yeah. do your job. <laughs> how are you doing? How, not, not just as a musician, but in general, how are you doing uh, in these chaotic times? Yes, I think uh, now that these these interviews for our new album happen in May is actually a good thing because there is some light at the end of the tunnel here in, in Germany, as I, I guess at your place as well. Um, but it was really a bit of you know, depressing and also just getting tired of that the that each day just feels so much the same without meeting people and being in the pandemic situation. Um, but luckily we did not have any... Uh, let's say, major uh, occurrences of, of health issues or anything. So that's a good thing. And also a good thing is that we had a lot of time uh, to deal with songwriting, arranging and recording a new album. So at least we, we used that uh, time to do something good. And how did it affect you in regards to the, the band? Because for obviously the majority of bands now rely pretty heavily on, on touring. So was this a very difficult time for, for the members of Fan Canto? Yeah, so luckily it, it fit quite well in our schedule, so to say, because we planned to record a new album in 2020 anyway, and that's why we only uh, had some festival gigs um, that have been postponed to 21 then, and now to summer 22. So uh, at least from 2020, it was not so much of a uh, of a bad situation for, for us because we just uh, had like three gigs planned and then we could focus on the on the album instead since you're one of the founding members of fan canto I, I would like you to take i would like you to take me a little bit back to 2006 when you guys started in the sense of uh, and i don't mean this to come out the wrong way i'm sorry but w what were you thinking uh, because it is definitely <laughs> that's what i mean i don't want it to come out the wrong way uh, it's not a criticism but it's definitely something different right i mean wh when you tell somebody hey let's start a band this is not what they imagine so who came up with the idea and how difficult was it to convince the rest? Yeah, so, so it's, it's basically me who came up with the idea. And um, I, although I do not remember all the details, of course, I can assure you that there was not so much thinking involved. It was more like uh, just trying things out. And it was never planned to be a band that exists for 15 years or records eight albums. I mean... We thought, let's try out something vocal oriented and uh, with more than just one singer. And while doing the recordings for the first songs, we noticed that with, with each uh, singer we recorded, it could be actually a good idea to leave the instruments away. Um, and then uh, we, we had the first two or three songs ready. I think I remember in the very beginning, I thought that we would still have a regular bass player beside the drummer. Uh, but then Ike joined and he just uh, had that beautiful low tuned voice and then we decided to go full a cappella besides the drums. Yeah, and then everything went quite fast. I mean, it went from a project between friends that wanted to record something in their own home studio to something that uh, pushed us on stage opening for Nightwish in just, I think, three, uh, uh, 13 months later. So it happened very fast, but it was not planned. But so from the very beginning, then you you didn't encounter uh, kind of opposition in the sense that every band when they're starting out it is a challenge to get make yourself known, uh, and for a band like Fancanto, I imagine that 
it must have been difficult, or perhaps it wasn't, uh, to, to convince uh, labels or to convince festivals that it wasn't just a novelty act and that this is something that is a real band, it's just that the instruments are different. Yeah, per perhaps nowadays I would tackle it the way you just described, but back then it was not that we were so successful with our former bands. So we all played in local metal bands before, and we, we had all this, what you just described, like convincing labels why they should sign us, um, convincing festivals why they should book us, and it was it, it just never happened. So that's also a reason why we did not have any expectation with, with Van Canto. It was actually the other way around when we put out that that YouTube video of the mission of our very, very first song. Uh, we were contacted by the festivals and then we had to make the decision, do we really want to be a band playing live or was this just a fun project for one album? And then we decided, okay, let's let's try to take this on the stages as, as well. And this was the actual moment where we decided that we're now a band. And from then I can I can honestly say it was way easier than with all the other bands we played in because we just we just were able to write an email with metal a cappella on your festival question mark and then the answer was like five minutes later oh hell yeah and uh, it was just way easier than uh, compared to our former bands something that i noticed today for example checking out youtube while i was checking some of the videos um is that you have a pretty dedicated fan base. Uh, so, so people who are pretty, feel really connected to the band, they were mentioning, for example, how happy they are to see the lineup that is going to be now in the band for this upcoming album. And that is interesting to me because for, for many bands who, who use uh, an unconventional approach, uh, either because they, they wear a costume, as for example, it happened to Lordi, uh, or in the case of Fancanto, where you use these different type of instruments, the challenge that you sometimes have is, based on what I've been taught, clearly I'm not experienced on a personal level, is you get the people through the door the first time because they're curious, and then the challenge is to keep, keep them coming back, that now they know what it is, but you still want them to like it and you still want to be entertained by that. And it is nice to see that you have had that kind of returning fans year after year after year. Yes, yes. Um... It's very good analysis. I mean, I, I think personally, I think that the most important choice that we made for the first album was that we uh, put a lot of original material on it and only two covers. Um, so that it was clear that we're not like an act that is booked for a festival late night to play all these smash hits and then go off stage, but really build a fan base with what we want to express with our music. Uh, and then it was really about playing live and showing the world that it's not like a gimmick band or a fun project, but a real band going on tour, uh, engaging with the people after the show. Um, and yeah, that's, I think that's the reason why we also grew a fan base like a regular metal band. And we are still make, uh, when, when we're on stage in a, for example, on a festival in a country where we haven't played before, we, um, or, or even if we played before, we always ask the, the audience who is listening to Van Canto for the first time. And still, in uh, also on our last tour in 2018 and the gigs in 2019, there were like 30 or 40 percent of each show where we get new people in. So it, it still somehow works that, that that label of a cappella metal, what, what is that, still attracts new people. And at the same time, uh, we have some early days fans that still visit us at every tour. That's great. And for you, in, in this part of the acapella part, uh, in the part that you're in charge of, for example, the lower rakatakataka, uh, as a, as a non-singer, so explain it to me a little bit. Is it, is, it a, is it very tiring for you to be in this type of band where you're constantly creating not just long songs, but very short, dun, 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 dun. Is that tiring on a... On, on, the, on your breathing, on your chest, as you're performing that in a concert, more so than if you were playing guitar, because I know that you're a guitarist uh, as well. Yeah, it is. So basically, for the for the breathing part of it, so playing live means for the for the rhythm guitar singers, we want to produce a constant output so that the sound does not like break away. So this is the actual challenge to have a 90 minute show and manage your breathing while being in a hot um, on on a hot stage on and moving on stage and everything uh, from a singing tech style it's not that it's more exhausting than other singing so if that 
was the case, then we would have a problem if it really like affects our vocal cords because it's unhealthy to sing that style, then we would have a problem after 15 years. But that's not the case. It's really like managing your breathing and and get along with not so much air on a 90 minute live show. <laughs> right. If you, you, you don't, as long as you can be not breathing a lot for 90 minutes, you should be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we cannot manage it entirely without breathing. We're still working on that. But uh, no, there, there are always some... Uh, some major drum fills in every part of uh, our songs where we can take small breaths. But for example, the um, the riff around Master of Puppets, where it goes like um, con constantly thrash metal like uh, riff notes, then you really have to. I, I really wait for the drums to have that dun dun uh, small hits where I could have a short breath and then uh, carry on. That's that's the tough part of being a rakataka singer. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, <laughs> on the 4th of June, you're going to release your, your new album, uh, To the Power of Eighth. And, uh, and besides being your eighth album, it's also a return to a lineup of eight, uh, because yeah. one of your lead vocalists, Sly uh, Schunke, uh, left the band in 2017. He's now back as a guest on all songs. So first, is it the Power of Eight members, the Power of the Eighth album? Uh, which which uh, power? Both? What are we talking about? Both, both. I think when we started discussing a potential album title it was more about the eighth album um, and then we had um, a summer breeze festival gig here in germany where sly joined us as a guest uh, on the live show and it played out very well and then we asked him if he wants to be a guest on one or two songs um, and then the pandemic kicked in and we had so much time and creativity to share that we decided to make it a full eight musician appearance. And then To the Power of Eight had a double meaning in terms of um, the eighth album and eight musicians on it. And it just fit. And I was taking, as I said, the, the YouTube comments, particularly under the, the trailer for your new album. And, and people are super happy that Sly is, is back on that position and I think that it is the challenge that every band has when a voice that became very much associated with them suddenly goes away and then comes back. Do you think that, uh, because first of all just to confirm, Sly is not officially back in the band, he's only a guest in this case. Yeah, so the, the reasons for him uh, not being able to be a full-time professional musician anymore haven't changed uh, so much, they do not lie in, like in the band or in the personal relationship but just as life moves on and not everything uh, can be managed oh. so easy, like compared with being 25 or something. Mm -hmm. But um, recording an album is not so much uh, organization stuff like if you plan a world tour or something. So um, during the pandemic, it was easy for us to distribute the recording of the album over the complete year to have him uh, also be part of it. Um, so th that was that was that. And that's why we clearly um, marked him as a special guest but not uh, as like an eight member lineup for all future to be the case did you write any of the songs and the lyrics for uh, this upcoming album i asked because i noticed i was reading the lyrics napalm was kind enough to make them available and um well a lot of them follow the power metal themes right the battles fights epic stuff a lot of manowar-esque uh kind of lyrics uh, when you write music of that ilk, where does your inspiration come from in the sense of music, uh, sorry, uh, movies, uh, books, uh, when you write music that deals with the kind of fantasy uh, feel? Yeah, so so on this album, actually, I, I did most of the songwriting again. Last albums, we split more between band members, but this time we wanted to bring the three lead singers together. So we thought it would be good to have a more consistent songwriting style from, from one person. Um, and personally, I don't, I think I know what you mean when you talk about manowarish and fantasy, but I think this is more the the uh, way that the lyrics are expressed when they're finished. The input uh, or the inspiration are, are not so much fantasy based for for me personally. Um, mm. I do not read many books to be honest, and I also do not watch uh, TV so often. So it's more about that yeah motivational topic that Van Canto has, like. Uh, do, do your own thing and believe in yourself and try things out and get stronger by trying and so on. So th this is the the message. If if Van Kato has one message, then this this is it. Uh, and that the lyrics are um, somehow in a fantasy style is more the way that I write them, but not how they are inspired. 
Oh, that's very interesting. I had no idea. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's really cool. Uh, I was looking at the cover album, to, uh, the cover art, I'm sorry, uh, and it's a ship with, I believe it's your singer, right? Uh, Inga, uh, pulling the, the, the ship. Uh, what is the concept behind that cover? <laughs> um, generally speaking, the, the Van Canto artworks are not uh, like so important in terms of let's pick one concept and then we have to have an art for it and the song titles and everything we had one concept album with voices of fire and there of course everything matched but um, the the major thing that we want to achieve with the artwork is that somebody who sits down and listens to the entire album 50 minutes of Ancanto music he should have something in his hands where he can where he can also find some details in the artwork watch uh, perhaps a vinyl artwork or read the lyrics uh, and so we try we just try to take small uh, symbols or moments from the album title and somehow express them in the artwork. For example, the the power, um, uh, like pulling a ship into a harbor. Um, also continuing the the rust team a theme from trust in rust uh, and to move that from a rusty industrial environment to a harbor scene. That's why uh, Inga is pulling a ship. Um, you can see an eight knot in the rope because it's to the power of eight. And these kind of details or symbols, it's just like a big picture to look at and to find some details while you're um, listening to the to the music. But the maritime thing is also in the in the trailer, right? I think there is a, an aircraft carrier that is also kind of on the trailer. So it's just because it matches in this case with the with the cover. Right? You have three covers in this upcoming album, and four, uh, four actually, four. Oh, oh I, I thought, thought it's it just, just I'm on a Mars, Iron Maiden, and ACDC. What which which is the, the fourth? fourth. And, uh, uh, I want it all from Queen. Oh yeah, okay, that's my bad then. So why did you pick this for? Uh, basically, we are a little bit old-fashioned when it comes to um, arranging an album, so we still think in complete albums and not in single songs. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that has to match is that the covers somehow fit in the in the album uh, order of songs, or if we have like if we have too much fast songs, then we would pick the covers more in a mid-tempo style and the other way around. And of course, we wanted to show um, the the capabilities of the different lead singers. So that's why we uh, pick different songs for like the sweet spots of each of each lead singer. And then, of course, we have to lo uh, like the the originals. We have to relate to them, especially the lead singer. Yeah, and this we just wanted to show a, a broad range of like death metal cover with growling vocals to ACDC to hard rock with Queen and a very fast Iron Maiden song that we somehow transported a little bit into a more modern sound and putting Inga in charge of the lead vocals. So many small ideas and, de uh, and decisions that finally lead to the selection of the of the cover songs. I was checking today that uh, besides your, your role as a musician, you also do mixing and producing. Uh, but you mentioned that your most su successful production to date is your uh, son, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> that, that is like the most successful one yet. Um, I found that on my homepage, I guess, and yeah, yeah, yeah on your production website. No, I wasn't spying anything personal. Uh, no, no, so no, no, no. this just reminds me that I have to update it because uh, I already have a daughter since four years now, and I should oh, uh, okay. put her on that website as well too. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that. Um, has it been a very big challenge? Because I, I think we, I ask it about the people that I know are dads who are in, in a band. Has it been a very big challenge for you to be a touring musician doing world tours with the family back home? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, side fact is that my children are also Inga's children. So when we are on tour, um, it's actually really a family touring event. Mm. Um, so Lucas has been on a tour with us in a tour bus for four times already and he's used to it uh, and uh, our daughter uh, also has been part of the touring crew and and for us of course it's it's not that hard because we are used to be together as a family but it's really great to see how the rest of the band and the complete crew also are fine with it that there are small children on tour because you have to behave a little bit different of course if you have <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, yes, yes. Yeah, but but that's I mean that's uh, that's the deal with with Van Canto. There are other bands where if I had kids, I would just leave them at home with my wife. But my wife has to be the lead singer of this band, so we have to manage it somehow. 
And until I, now, it worked out well. Since I know that we're getting closer and closer to the end, uh, two more questions. So first, based on your on the covers that you tend to include in your albums, I get an idea of what your favorite genres or favorite bands are. But just to, to get like a more clear idea, uh, it doesn't need to be an influence. I mean, there are a lot of, I play music as well, and there's a lot of music that I play that has nothing to do with the music that I like. So what is the, the music that, that you grew up listening to that kind of drove you to heavy metal and, and that sort of stuff? Yeah, but why is that? Why would you play music that you don't like? This makes no sense. Oh, no, no, I mean, I like it, but it's not like the, the music. I mean, it doesn't influence the way in which I, I play. What I mean is that there is music that I listen to and that I enjoy, but that the music that I play uh, is not influenced by that. It just happens to be something that I enjoy. Yeah, that, I, I can relate to that, although I think sometimes you are perhaps even inspired and you don't know that you are. So if you listen to a specific style or a specific band, then perhaps you don't want to show that direct inspiration, but somehow in the back of your brain, of course, it's it's there when you write new music. Uh, but for me personally, it's just the way that you described. So taking a look at the Van Canto covers or the bands that we covered is basically my personal best of uh, or my favorite favorite bands. Um, and I think when it comes to singing styles, um, also the inspiration is is perhaps obvious, or at least you, you can see it like that choir stuff inspiration from Blind Guardian. Uh, the way that we write, uh, at least in the in the power metal songs, we write the lyrics and the, uh, not the lyrics, but the vocal lines. Uh, it's of course very Eric Adams inspired. My my voice, if I sing, is very James Hetfield inspired. So you can get these inspirations, and I think this is how music works. Uh, every generation picks up some inspirations from the former generation, and perhaps somewhere out there are people that are inspired by Van Canto lead singers. I don't know, and so we just take it um, through throughout the evolution of music. Since you mentioned James Hetfield as an influence in your voice, can you do a James Hetfield? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! That is very good. <laughs> that was excellent, man. Actually, actually, the guitar singing, I have to uh, mention that. Mm -hmm. Like the -da 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 -da, this style is basically like James Hetfield, only one octave lower. So for me personally, it's uh, very comfortable because in, in, in Hevata, where I'm the lead singer, I can just do the James Hetfield style. And in my canto, I do the same thing, just one octave lower and skip the lyrics and replace them by really diddly diddly and stuff. But with Hematar, then you, then you need to add a lot of ooh as you play. Just every every other uh, stanza has to finish with ooh. Yeah, yeah. There, I think there's actually some videos out there where somebody cut all oohs and yeahs from James Hetfield into one video. I think it just lasts like 25 minutes or so. Yeah, it, it is, is a surprisingly long, long video. video. I, I have seen, seen it. it. Stefan, thank you so much for your time. It was really enjoyable. I wish you all the best and to you, your wife and your, your children and uh, lots of success in any uh, future productions.